Hello, I'm Nicholas Close, and welcome to Echo Valley Vlogs. Today, I'm interviewing my uncle Chris Close about the history of Echo Valley Farm and the area surrounding it. Okay, so first off, where are we? We're in the township of Red Hook. Red Hook is the northwest corner of Dutchess County. It's about 53 square miles of rolling hills, farmland, and two major villages, the village of Red Hook and the village of Tivoli and three hamlets, which are population centers, but they are not incorporated as municipalities, as are Red Hook and Tivoli villages. There is the uh, hamlet of Annandale, which has Bard College, founded in 1860 and now about 2,500 students from all over the world. And there is uh, uh, Upper Red Hook, Annandale, Upper Red Hook, and Berrytown. Berrytown is on the river, and it was uh, for many, many years a stop on the Hudson River Railroad, which ran right up the east side of the Hudson River. And there was a train station there, but it's another hamlet surrounded by farmland. So we are blessed to be here on the farm within the township of Red Hook. And again, our farm is typical of the area. It's about 100, just over 100 acres, about 106 acres now. And it's rolling hills and meadows and uh, big red barns and a white farmhouse and woods and a stream in the Sawkill. Cool. Okay, so how many years has our family owned this farm? Well, mother and dad uh, moved into the farm in May of 1943 with your grandfather, Woody, and uh, his older brother, Taylor, who was the oldest of the six of us, and his younger brother, Kevin, who's five years older than I am. They moved in in May of 1943, and they had been looking for a farm for about a year. They looked into Connecticut for the first uh, for the first go around of seeing where they could possibly buy a farm in Connecticut, but by then uh, Connecticut was much too expensive. It had been so for 200 years, so they couldn't afford anything in Connecticut. Then they looked in New Jersey, and New Jersey was filled with pig farms. They didn't want to live next to a big farm or own a big farm, so they finally found Echo Valley Farm in. Um, in 1943 and they moved in in May of 1943 and uh, in my father's hand your great-grandfather's hand uh, there's a penciled notation uh, this is paradise or turned out to be and the uh, one-page flyer about the farm which said how many acres it was and then it was 102 acres and there were 14 registered Holstein cows a tractor a team of horses and all the implements for farming, then available in uh, agriculture in 1943. Huh. Now, we kind of covered this already, but yeah. why did they buy it? Well, they bought it because my father had grown, he, he was one of two children, uh, born in uh, Minneapolis in Minnesota, out in the upper Midwest. And his fondest memories as a, as a boy with his brother, Raleigh, who was two years younger, uh, was of their summer spent on their grandfather's farm in St. James, Minnesota, which had a white farmhouse, a picket fence, big red barns, and water. <laughs> so when my father, your great-grandfather, found this place, he said, well, this is paradise, or turned out to be, because it had everything that he'd remembered so fondly from his boyhood on his grandfather's farm in Minnesota. So that's how we have Echo Valley Farm, and it's a great story, and I'm sticking with it. That's an awesome story. Yeah. What is your earliest memory of the farm? My earliest memory of the farm? Well, I think my earliest memory was of being down by the creek with uh, mother and dad and the, my three older brothers, and uh, we had an old uh, buckboard seat that had been converted into a, a glider. And it was on the banks of the of the of the stream on the sock hill, and I was going back and forth and back and forth, and I slipped into the water. And at three years of age, I didn't know how to swim, and my father jumped in and saved me from drowning. So that's my earliest memory of being on the farm or in the creek, actually, which is uh, it's a fun memory. And the, ne and the next memory I have is 
is really uh, when I was five, a very vivid image of, of getting ready for kindergarten and going off to school on the big yellow school bus, school bus number 12, driven by Ed Stickle. And uh, I had a little blue corduroy jacket on, and it was September of 1950, which is now a long time ago, but climbing up into the big bus and going off to school. Okay, and next question. What is your favorite memory of the farm? Uh -huh. My favorite memory of the farm. I have many, many favorite memories. They all kind of are under the headline of the farm. Uh, the woods and the fields and the, and the barns, the old barns, which burned down in 1999, of course. We knew every inch and foot and nook and cranny of the old barns. And it's, uh, so that's very, very vivid in my memory about all of the, the every space in the house and every space in, on the, in the woods and the lawns and uh, the stream and the hills, it's all, all of a piece. There's not one favorite memory, it's all just a, one big favorite memory. It's kind of a, it's the family's anchor. And uh, it's all about place and time and, and our family and the people who are here. And as, uh, as it happens, all the generations and generations of cows and horses and sheep and dogs and cats uh, who have come and gone over the years here on Echo Valley Farm. They've been pets and they've been farm animals and they've been funny animals like Hal, who was our big... Uh, police horse. He was a retired police horse from New York City, from the New York City Police Department. Huh. And he was with us for about three years or so, or three or four years in the early, late 40s, early 50s. And he had, like all horse, horses in the police department in those days, he had a tattoo on his lip, upper lip, take it like that, and he had a tattoo, a number, so they could trace him if he ever got stolen or anything like that. But he had a fondness for tobacco. <laughs> And my father, who smoked, he shouldn't have smoked, nobody should ever smoke, but my father smoked Chesterfields, and he would go, and he would take a Chesterfield, which was an unfiltered cigarette, and he'd rip the package, and he'd tap out the, the uh, tobacco from the cigarette, and give it to Hal, and Hal would go, and Hal would love it. <laughs> so I remember fondly that wonderful big horse of ours, and then my first cat in the world was Toodles. Uh, it was a barn cat, uh, but there have been, as I said, generations of all sorts of interesting people and pets and animals on the farm. Cool. Um, you mentioned the the barns burning down. Do you want to talk a little bit about that as yes, far as our history? I would. Uh, the barns, like all the farmsteads around here and up and down the Hudson Valley, had big red barns, and they they had been built. Well, the 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 farm dates, as far as we can tell, as far as the research has been done, um, it dates from 1745. There's a date stone in the foundation of the farmhouse that says 1745 on it, and it has the initials M, P, and C, P. And we've since researched it, have done by Emily Major, who's a board member of Historic Red Hook and a Cracker Jack historic preservationist, and an historic uh, preservation carpenter. And she did the research on the farm and she traced the deeds back to the original owners, I think, with Michael and Catherine Pulver, MP and CP, as etched out in the date stone in the farmhouse in the foundation. So we dated to 1745 and uh, I think probably it's true. The original barns are quite old, but probably, you know, dating from the early to the mid part of the 19th century. And they'd just gotten bigger over the years when anybody needed anything and they, the farmer needed more space, he would just add on to the barns. So by the time we came around in 1943, there was a big hay barn with the cows underneath and the cow barn underneath and there was a grain room off uh, on, the, on the big barn side which had a grain chute and you'd take a big burlap bag and open it and, and uh, funnel the uh, the grain down into a grain, a grain bin, and uh, it would go down the chute and into the bin. 
And then there was a big hay floor, main floor of the barn, with the big doors on either side of the barn. And then there was a hay mow, a straw mow, but underneath the straw mow here, the hay mow was over on the right. The hay mow was, or the straw mow was here, and the horses were down below. So we had stalls for about, about six, six horses. Really? Mm-hmm. And then tacked on, there was another part of the barn that had been built was a work shed with another hay mow over the top of that. And then uh, a garage where there was a room for a car. And then off that, there was a smaller uh, building, all attached, all one big building. That was a pigsty. That's where the pigs were kept. And then there were two outbuildings. There was the tractor barn and the carriage house. And the carriage house is where you, well, your, your father grew up, and Woody, your father, and I mean your grandfather, and uh, and your father, Nicholas, and Nick, and Peter, his brother, and sister Elizabeth grew up in what had been the original house on the property, the carriage house. It was an early 18th, uh, um, maybe mid to late 18th century Dutch farmhouse. Hmm. It had mud and, uh, and straw walls. It had post and beam construction. It had a Dutch door, a double Dutch door. You know, the top would open and the bottom would stay closed if you wanted it. And it had all the classic lines of a Dutch farmhouse. And so in 1977, when your grandfather and mother built their house, they took that barn down and kept the kept the uh, the beams and the posts in Tibby's house, okay, which you know is Tibby's house, your grandmother's house, right. and it follows the same footprint of the original Dutch house. Cool. And the farmhouse itself, the major part, dates from 1867, and it was a classic Victorian farmhouse. Uh, but the smaller side of the house is probably early 19th century, late 18th century, and then the summer kitchen, which is attached to the back of the house, is probably the oldest extant building still on the farm, and that dates from the 18th century. And so this is a farm that has been in, under cultivation for 250 years. Really, and we're just about, I think we're the fifth family to own the farm, which is a pretty good record. Yeah. Um, what is the biggest difference from when you were a kid to now on the farm? <laughs> there are no cows left anymore. When I was a kid in the, in the 50s and 60s, Red Hook was a totally rural village. There were, there were about 3,500 people in the township. The village has always had around a thousand people in it. Tivoli is a little smaller, maybe 750 people. And then the rest of the rest of the people were all spread out on farms like this one. We bordered the Heinz farm, which is a dairy farm. On the other side of the Salk Hill, the stream that runs through the farm, was the Teeter farm. And they were, they were farmers, and they'd been uh, dairy farmers forever. And uh, they closed their dairy in 1964. It was the last working dairy farm in Echo Valley Road. But basically what you would see 60 years ago here in the landscape would be black and white cows, Holsteins everywhere. Now oh. there's only one dairy left, and that's across the road on Route 9, which is one half of the old Heinz farm, which the other half is Michael Robertson's farm, and that borders us on the field across the road. So there were just really just farms, 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 right up to the village, right up to the right up to the uh, boundaries of the village. So you would see lots of cows, you would see very few cars. Uh, we knew every car that went by. Uh, there were about six or seven regulars that buy every day, not the traffic we have today. And the, and the road was dirt road. From just north, or just, just beyond the driveway, it was all dirt, right up to Fraley Lane, and Fraley Lane was dirt, it was all dirt. And every spring they would bring out the grader from, from the village, uh, the, the town highway department, and they would grade the road and get it ready for the summer. So it was very different then. And the school, of course, we knew everybody. We knew everybody's dog. Everybody knew everybody else. 
because it was a very small village, very small township. But then the Kingston Rhinecliff Bridge went through in 1957 and opened. And within three years, 500 houses had sprung up in the township, beginning with College really? Park. Mm -hmm. Really? Huh. Because IBM had opened a factory in Kingston. And between 1957 and 1961 or two, it went from zero employees to about 5,000 employees. So they needed to live someplace. So Red Hook was chosen as the kind of bedroom community and farmers began to sell off their land. And where you had cows, now you have ranch houses and, and developments like College Park or Willow Park or Linden Acres, those, those things. Now, you weren't born when the far when we bought the farm. No, I wasn't family, born. Right? No, I was born in March of 45. I was a war baby. The Second World War was still on. wasn't going to be over for another couple of months. And I was born on uh, March 20th of 1945, just about three weeks before Franklin Delano Roosevelt, our wonderful president, died of a stroke and down in Warm Springs, Georgia. Um, so I'm, I'm not a baby boomer, I'm a war baby, proudly so. <laughs> okay, and where did the name for Echo Valley Farm come from? Mother and, Corn and the Valley, road. that's the road. Well, the road came later after your grandfather put in the development between, uh, you know, when they bought the, the farm next door, I think. I did on Teeter, Teeter Road, I think, before then, because they had been here longer as a family, but they... They left and sold. So, uh, Echo Valley Farm was named by my mother, your great-grandmother, because we would get out and, and you could stand on the lawn in front of the house. And in those days, there were very few trees around, all along the sock hill, for example. So that you had a clear sounding board in the side of the big Dutch barn that's down on the, now for the former Teeter property. That was, a, that was the barn where they kept their cows and all their hay and tractors and things like that. So you could go, whoo, and it would echo. So mother said, ah, oh, let's call this Echo Valley Farm. And that's how the name has stuck for 77 years. And now well into the future, thanks to you and your cousins and sister and everybody else who's coming along in the fourth and fifth generations here of the close family. Okay, so now, Tell me a little bit about Red Hook High School. Ha! Huh. Well, Red Hook High School was really not Red Hook High School. It was the Red Hook Central School. Because in, 19, in the 1930s, of course, there was the Depression, the Nationwide Depression. And there was, at that time, a movement to consolidate small school districts into one central school district. In other words, they went from one-room schoolhouses, of which there were 10 in Red Hook, serving Red Hook, parts of Milan, and parts of uh, Columbia County up to Claremont. There were little schoolhouses. For example, there was one, the building that still exists, it's now a house. It's over on the Fraley Farm. It was called the Fraley School. And that was school district number five, I think. So there were little, little one-room schoolhouses for all the children who lived on, in the village or on the, on the farms, the surrounding farms. And in 1930, Six, the high school itself, the Red Hook High School, burned down, and people began to live or go to school in the Grand Duchess, what is now the Grand Duchess, and other big houses around. They turned it into a temporary school. And by 1939, they had built a, a new, brand new, state-of-the-art modern school under the Works Project Administration, which was a Depression-era program begun by President Roosevelt to consolidate and improve educational resources for the country. And so Red Hook possesses one of the fine examples of, of that era. And it opened in 1939 and consolidated everything from kindergarten through graduation. Wow. Senior year, 13 years of school. You wow. started in Miss Berenger's class as I did in 1950, teaching uh, kindergarten. And you graduated uh, from the front steps of the school, which are on Linden Avenue. The front of the school is on Linden Avenue. And that was always where graduations took place. And so you 
went 13 years of schooling from, you know, from the back of the building to the front of the building <laughs> and graduated. So it was, uh, it was wonderful. And when your great grandfather, no, your grandfather, <laughs> your grand, my brother, your grandfather, was a star basketball player on the 1956 team, they were undefeated. But I can remember we all went and packed the gymnasium in the Red Oak Central School, the Linden Avenue Middle School. The bleachers were rolled out, everybody jammed in and they watched basketball games where Reddick would take on Rhinebeck and beat Rhinebeck or they'd be playing planes, their big rivals. And it was a wonderful, uh, wonderful time. Uh, everybody knew each other again and all the kids were on the team and, and uh, your grandfather was a, a fine basketball player and he was also a student council president. And your grandmother was a cheerleader. I still can't see that. Two, four, six, eight. Who do we appreciate? <laughs> and they would. I still she, can't see. She Tibby, was and Tibby Smithers. Yeah, exactly. Tibby Smithers and Sue Tremper and uh, all all sorts of wonderful other other people. Now, when did it become all the separate buildings that it is now? Oh well, it began. I think the uh, my generation the. the from the mid to 19 to the or from the mid 40s to the early 50s, there was a huge baby boom. So they needed to house. The, the classes were getting too big for the building, so they built the uh, the middle the the elementary school, I think in the early 60s, and then they built the high school just a little after that, and so they kept the original Red Oak Central School as the middle school. So now we have the, the high school, which is getting a brand new auditorium, thank God, after all of these years. Yeah. And the middle school, which is on Linden Avenue, and then the elementary school, which is out on Mill Road. So we have, it's a very good, it's one of the best school systems in the country. Year after year, it's voted one of the best uh, in the country, which is great. So that's why people come to Red Oak. They want to live in Red Oak for the beauty of the, of, of the town and its history and its education because you can't get a better education. Well, I, I also heard that your parents had a radio show. What was <laughs> it called? And what yeah. was it about? What well, did they do? It was Red Hook 3-1. And the reason why it was called Red Hook 3-1 is because we didn't have a private telephone. Because the telephone was a party line. A party line meant that you shared one telephone line, came out from the village, came out from the telephone company exchange, which was over what is now Annabelle's Bakery. That right. was for many, many years, for more than a century, it was the village pharmacy, the drugstore. I remember it being that. Uh, and, and over it was the telephone exchange, where operators would sit and plug you in. But our calling number was 3-1, Red Hook 3-1. That was before the area code and the 758 and all that sort of stuff. It was, you just dialed Red Hook and I, please connect me to Red Hook 3-1. So they called their show Red Hook 3-1. And it ran for about a year and a half from 1947 to 48. And it was an interview show, five days a week, 15 minutes a day transcribed, that means recorded, here at the farm, but then taken into the city and broadcast from Radio City over the mutual broadcasting system nationwide. So mother and dad were here and your grandfather and I and your other uncles were basically part of the whole show, but mother and dad would interview the chief of police or in certain instances visiting writers or directors and things like that, people from the arts and culture, as well as they interviewed Mrs. Rosa after the war, after her husband died. Her husband died on, on, in April of 45, but she was a, a major force for good around the world her entire life. But after the war, she was, uh, she was an honorary chairwoman of the, uh, of the Dutchess County Fair in 1948, and mother really? was the Mother was the was the chairperson of the Red Oak Garden Club, so which they met, and there's a wonderful photo of uh, my mother, your grand, your great grandmother, and and Mrs. Roosevelt at the fair in 1948. So it was a wonderful show. It ran, and it was the uh, the 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 way that uh, mother and dad made a living for us, and then the rest is history since then. But we have. Uh, 
we have recordings from from such interviews as one that they did with uh, Bronco Charlie Miller. Bronco Charlie Miller was then, this was about 1948 or so, he lived at Ward Manor, which was then a, a, an old person's home, a, a nursing home, and he had been, he was the last of the Pony Express riders. The Pony Express was about a 15-month experiment in 1861 they would hire kids, young kids, a little younger than you, Nicholas, and they would ride from St. Joe, Missouri to Sacramento, California. Wow, that's a long trip. Right, by staging. They put a series, of, this is before the telegraph, the, the national telegraph system went through. So the fastest way to get news or mail from the midsection of the country to the West Coast was via the Pony Express. So they interviewed Bronco Charlie Miller on their show. And we have a photo downstairs of Bronco Charlie in the kitchen with me and my three brothers, your grandfather among them, with our six guns. And Bronco Charlie Miller had his six gun on too. <laughs> the days of cowboys and Indians. Um, where do you see the farm in 10 years? That's a good question. I see the farm, uh, as I've always seen the farm, it's still its magical beauty. Has big red barns and a big white house, and uh, I see lots of people. Your generation is coming of age, taking on responsibility to the farm. Your father will be farm manager, replacing me. I hope to still be here in 10 years. I may not be. Every day is a gift, and uh, I see it as thriving. I see bees and honey being raised. I see sugar being made. I see cows, beef cattle. I see pick-your-own-flower operations, pumpkins in the fall, people stopping by and, you know, enjoying the beauty of this farm, and more and more closes populating all, all of the houses we have around here. That's where I see it. Awesome. And then finally, what is your role on the farm, oh, and what does it entail? My role? Well, I'm the farm manager. <laughs> it's a big title. I even get a card to go with it, a business card. <laughs> My role is just to be here and help take care of the place and make it as best we can make it. And we've done a lot of gardening over the Claudine and I have been here since full time since 2009. And it's been a privilege every day as I wake up and it's a miracle that we're here. And we love being here and living here and being involved in the community. Uh, I'm on the Zoning Board of Appeals, and I'm also the Secretary of the Economic Development Committee, and we uh, we are very much a part of Historic Red Hook, which your great aunt, uh, Claudine, has uh, managed to uh, beautifully as president for the last five years, and she began it and put it together, and it's a thriving, really excellent, award-winning historic society devoted to maintaining the ongoing stories of Red Hook. So it's it's part and parcel of what we've always been involved in since mother and dad were doing a radio show 70 years ago. That kind of continuum, that's what I look to. And my responsibility is to help the family stay here and, and be well. So that's my role. No, no official work involved, except mowing the lawn. <laughs> Well, thank you. I really appreciate your time, well, t taking time out of your busy day to My busy do day this. For, for my nap. <laughs> thank you, Nicholas. I laud your repertorial skills and your technological uh, plum. I would never have had this happen before. Let's hope that audio is saved because my laptop just died. Oh, dear.